Well, howdy. Welcome to Politics for People Who Hate Politics, episode approximately number 17, barring various specials, so could be number 20. Who knows? Math is hard. Um, all right, so tonight we're going to talk about some stuff that we don't like and then some stuff we do like, but we'll spend a lot more time on the stuff we don't like. Um, we have two um, ever stalwart, I'm always trying to quote True Grit when I say that, um, guests, which is Joe and Michelle. Y'all know them by now. If you don't, God help you. And we have two uh, shiny new guests, uh, one of whom is our first international guest, Camilo Gomez, who's a philosophy student in Peru and has contributed to Counterpunch, which is a good, albeit overly leftist at times, publication, but also full of anarchism. So uh, welcome to Camilo. Oh, hi. <laughs> um, and we also have Zachary Yost, who is a person I know in real life, which, and I've seen him slightly recently. He gave me a ride to SFL and, is, and made the ride enjoyable, which I appreciate. Also, he's a senior at Mercyhurst University, uh, majoring in political science, and he knows a lot of things. And so that's good. <laughs> okay, um, we have a good panel here. I'm excited about this. Um, I feel a little bit like I'm covered in rabies because there was a bat in my house, but that's a different problem. I guess we're going to start off talking about, in a general way, how terrible politicians are, which is the purest type of subject on this particular podcast. Um, we have the Hillary Clinton shenanigans, right, where her entire tenure at the, at the State Department was spent having all of her emails on these private Clinton servers, which everyone should be pissed over this because that kind of server is much less secure than a government server. Um, and also, it's conveniently a way to get around uh, Freedom of Information Act requests. Um, and I've seen some some really pathetic Democrats acting like that's not a big deal. I don't see why it's not. Um, and sort of as a nice companion piece to that, um, there's the fact that David Petraeus leaked stuff, classified stuff to his mistress slash biographer, and is basically getting nothing but a fine for it. So... Who's first against the wall? No, I'm sorry. That's you that. Um, <laughs> Zach, I feel like do you want to share with the class about either Petraeus or Clinton? I feel like you have words for this. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, I guess it's just uh, both are instances of kind of the ridiculous double standards. I mean, Hillary Clinton literally was running a server out of one of her houses, apparently. Um, so I mean, that's um, in a way, it's not surprising, and I know that other people in the government use private email for similar reasons, but it's just, uh, yeah, it's not really surprising that this sort of stuff happens, and I'm not, I'm a little surprised at how light Petraeus got off, um, but I mean, it's just sort of basically uh, uh, you know, class everyone else. So, um, are you actually surprised by Petraeus getting such a mild punishment? I mean, I know former CIA um, and NSA people have gotten um, not huge punishments, not like Chelsea Manning levels, but they've gotten mm -hmm. some punishments for leaking. So, basically, nothing. Um, is kind of a ridiculous punishment. Um, yeah, yeah, forty thousand dollars is nothing to him, and I mean, yeah. I thought he might serve a little time in some cushy prison, <laughs> and then like get out a week later on parole or something. But I, I honestly was a little surprised at how light it was. But overall, um, I'm not surprised they're not throwing the book at him. Yeah. Well, what about Clinton? I mean, do you like? Um, I know Charles Cook, who is like the least awful person at National Review, uh, which is saying not, never mind, let's not go there. Um, he basically wrote a thing today where he was like, um, y'all progressives might want a new candidate that's not Clinton in case this gets more um, ridiculous. And I mean, I, 
I don't know. I find horse race politics kind of tedious, but honestly, like, who the hell would that be? Everyone's acting yeah. like it's her or nothing. Or um, the fake, our fake Indian friend Elizabeth Warren, or I don't know. <laughs> oh, that'd be a good one. Well, the, I mean, the, the Democrats have a, Hillary Clinton is the golden child, I guess, of this 2016 election, so, you know, obviously they're going to downplay as much as possible. I, I think if she wasn't the front runner, I think if she wasn't the establishment favorite, there'd probably be more of a, you know, stink raised about this, but there's so much invested in her right now that I just don't, I don't think this is going to, you know, end her, you know, her candidacy already. I mean, it's, maybe if we had a, a stronger vice president or something, but you know, I, I don't think we're going to hear enough about this compared to how, you know, ridiculous it really is. Well, I mean, they're saying, like, I think, is it um, Jeb Bush or, or Chris Christie? I don't care, because they, they're all awful. Um, like, other people have done this, but, like, mm -hmm. that's the lowest form of political argument, and it's also the most prominent. But he did it, too. Well, you should all be fired. What's your point? And she's the Secretary of State, so it's kind of, you know, a bigger deal for her than it is for, you know, the governor of Florida or whatever like that, you know. This is yeah. top-level kind of stuff, and, you know, anyone could hack into her servers. There's no way they're more secure than the State Department. And then she can also just avoid any type of, you know, FOIA requests and basically just keep private whatever she wants and, you know. It's such a blatant loophole. And not to mention, like, this is, this is also, like, a sort of, um, comparing to, to Snowden, they kept saying with Snowden that they weren't even sure all of the documents he had snagged. Um, and that, plus the fact that they hired someone who did that, doesn't speak to their ability to keep secrets. So it's like simultaneously there's this like leaking is bad thing in the government. Leaking will be punished unless it's not. Um, and then there's we can keep anything we want secret, but uh, with the servers being so insecure, they're, they, I don't care. I mean, I don't. I don't think that I care that much if she's endangering the secrets of Benghazi or whatever with her <laughs> dot Hillary email address. But like, someone probably does. Um, like, this feels r very real of a scandal, in spite of what horrible, pathetic Democrat sycophants are saying. Uh, I mean, Look, I, I think I think she tweeted out uh, earlier. Uh, I want you to see the emails. That, yes. Uh, I yeah, don't follow her, but I saw that, yeah. Yeah, it, it, it sounded like a celebrity telling us, like, I want you to know I'm dating, like, this <laughs> famous starlet. Like, it's like, oh, and, and people, like, I've talked to some uh, friends who aren't really, like, interested in this crap, um, and they've heard me mention, like, oh, isn't this crazy with uh, the servers and emails and whatnot? And they're like, yeah, nuts. <laughs> it's like that's where it ends. No one's gonna, <laughs> yeah. no one's gonna really care about it. it and that's very genius. It, it's though. also like because of the blurred lines about privacy and security, and just the role of the uh, of technology in our lives, kind of causing that blur, um, just adding to kind of uh, confusion about how I guess you know folks should feel about um, any sort of you know scandals like this. It's, it's just not meaty enough of a scandal. It's just... Yeah. Why, though? We're talking about I mean, servers. We're talking about email and servers. 98% yeah. of America the, just went... I guess <laughs> the, the biggest problem is that as the Democrats don't have anything in replacement for Hillary, the, the problem is who, who can feel that? It's sad for the McGovern Night Party to don't have a McGovern. I mean, all are warmongers, including... Elizabeth Warren. The, the only one that is not a warmonger is Jim Webb, but I don't think he could pull a lot of support. I don't know anything about Jim Webb, I confess, but um, you're right that the Democrats are as warmonger as the next. And I know plenty of Democrats um, who, in sort of in theory, are not excited about the hawkish part of Hillary. But they're going to fucking vote for her. They're going to. Um, 
and they're going to do it because abortion, which, um, or they're going, but they're going to do it because they want a lady president, um, and feminism, the worst possible, most status kind of feminism that there is. Are those going to be the campaign to... slogans, like because abortion, Hillary 2016? <laughs> That would be really good because it would be really accurate. I'm just on this podcast being mean to all of my friends that will never watch this. Um, <laughs> like how I bet every single female that I know, that I sort of knew in real life first is going to vote for Hillary Clinton if she's available to vote for. Like, like every single one, basically, except my mom. And... And... Well, no. maybe yeah, no one else, that's all. It's a it's um, a girl thing. It's just such a I mean it's it, that's the that's the most evil type of of inane feminism and it's actually it's more than inane because it's actively it's actively evil because it's like well it's a lady doing bad things isn't that what we want isn't that what <laughs> quality is all about? Is, I mean, is there anything that she could be any like stance she could have that would prevent? any of these people from voting for her. She could suddenly become pro-life. That would be the only way. The funny thing is that Hillary could have been a libertarian. He's, she supported Goldwater in 64, and then she, when when she became anti-war initially, he, she was near to Carl Oglesby, who was the, the writer of the, was the president of the SDS, and, and then wrote a conspiracy book, the the cowboy and Yankee war, and he was kind of a Rothbardian, a left Rothbardian, but really voting and and some form of universal healthcare and minimum wage, but support individualism was very strange. But it was hmm. much better than Hillary now. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's not, I mean it's hard to. That's interesting. Um, it's hard to not be better than Hillary now. Like there's so little appeal to her that I, I'm really baffled. Like, and to be even more sort of petty, but like, she doesn't even use the Rodham part of her name anymore, right? Because that yeah. was too out, that kind of feminism was too out there for the government. Um, I mean, God, God, I really just, she, she bothers me so, so fundamentally. And this is not going to hurt her as much as we, we, we all probably wish it would. Yeah, at first, when I first saw it, I was like, holy smokes, this is like, this is pretty crazy, but then I found out more. It's like uh, Kerry is apparently the first State Department guy to apparently solely use his State Department email, and like it's apparently Colin Powell also got some flack for this once. But yeah, I think it's going to blow over at, at the very least because it can be passed off as oh, the super partisan Republicans are just attacking Hillary Clinton for partisan reasons, and there's no real substance to this. So I think at the very least, that's probably going to be why it goes away. Or something new and exciting will happen, and everyone will forget about it. <laughs> what? What's happening? Oh, new. Um, it's a story that makes us realize how uncool people like us are. Um, <laughs> we're like, oh my gosh, this, like Zach said, this is crazy. This will make national news. This is insane. <laughs> everyone will be up in arms. And it's like, no, 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 cool it, cool it. It's just yeah. you. <laughs> Well, the thing is, um, now, I, I, the, the Repo Republicans have too much of a chip on their shoulder, and their media is a crazed reaction to sort of a lack that the mainstream media, like, wasn't, that thing, the hole they weren't filling, whatever. <laughs> um, and, like, I think Radley Balco was right, as he tends to be, when he at one point dubbed the media authoritarian, not liberal, you know, the liberal media. But I honestly do think that Democrats, especially president-wise, in history and in media, they, they'd get off lighter than Republicans. Um, and that's, I can't really, you know, satisfactory, I, I can't prove that to any satisfaction, but it, it does feel that way to me. I think that um, Nixon was right when he was all bitter that North, Eastern douchebags like the Kennedy could get away with whatever they wanted, um, but he couldn't because he wasn't, you know, a charmer like the Kennedys. He was right, but his conclusion was, I should get away with anything I want to, even though I'm not a golden, golden boy from from the Northeast. 
Um, so I don't know. I just feel like I do feel like there's an element of Democrats get away with more. I do. I mean, Obama, you know. Plus, it, it happened too early in the election cycle. By the time people start campaigning, no one will remember. Yeah, the shockingly short attention span of America, except for like 9/11. Um, is is always a problem. I recently tried to pretend that I didn't know what 9/11 was to a troll. He got really mad at me. It was rough. I blocked him eventually, though. Oh, wow. <sighs> I yeah, remembering stuff is good. Um, Actually, though, I sort of think that Hillary being the Democratic nominee might be good in the long run. Um, explain. If, especially if Jeb Bush is the Republican nominee, <laughs> because if it's literally Bush versus Clinton again. I don't, I mean, it'll still be terrible that one of them will be elected. But I think there might be some segment of the population who will go, hey, this is sort of crazy. Like, this isn't, like, right. And then they will perhaps get a little more interested and might stumble upon libertarianism. I mean, it's not really, like, a great, this is awesome kind of deal, but we have to take what we can get. So that's sort of the silver lining, I guess I can see. That's sort of optimistic, but I, there's an element of that, of like, I hope more horrible things happen so people wake up. That's what that is, kind of. It's like, I hope that the bullshit quality of elections and the lack of choice becomes so blatant as to be Bush versus Clinton. Like, if we're going to do it, let's go all the way, like, burn the mother down 2016. That's so, I mean... If it's not going to be anyone redeemable, and I think at the end of the day, Rand Paul is still redeemable, <laughs> yeah. then it might as well be burn it all down 2016. So <laughs> I'm kind of with you there. Um, it's going to be horrifying, though. I really yeah. want to go to just the conventions and just report just hatred. Like, I'm not, I'm not God knows I'm not Mencken, but like, I'm, like the spirit of Mencken where you just go to political conventions, like, everyone is a horrible person, <laughs> democracy is a sham, yeah. you're all just, that's my dream, I'm going to work on yeah. this for next year. Uh, yeah. I'm going to CPAC, but even more tragic. Uh, and, um, um, the, the Democrat conventions in Cleveland, right? So, no, Philly! Is it in Philly? Oh, God they help you. They made a terrible... Oh, my gosh. <laughs> oh, it's in Philly? Yeah. They're State both State within State bus distance from me, I think. That's all I know. Oh, okay. oh right, right, right. Yeah, right. they're both so accessible to me. It's like I have to go. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, God help you, Michelle, with that. All we've ever had over here is um, G20, but that was special. We enough. have the Pope oh, come in. We have, uh, <laughs> yeah, we're just having so many people show up. So. It'll be nuts. Yeah, welcome those riot cops, because they're coming to, to protect the really important people who will be there. Spoiler alert, they're not important, and I'm not like them. <laughs> I'm feeling more full of hate than usual. It's because it's just what happens when you take uh, a podcast break of, like, two weeks. I mean, just the hate builds up, and you don't know what to do. No, really, it's, it's cool. Well, let's talk about Salon. Yeah, you're, I think you're right. Let's keep well, the hatred going strong. <laughs> Ramp it up. Ramp up the hate a little bit. Um, I read the piece on Honduras. It was very strange. I, I, I guess because, I mean, even when I talk to the most radical Marxists, I mean, they understand certain things about property rights and, and even they respect that. I, I once talked with the former chairman of the of the... Mariate's uh, unified party was a revolutionary Marxist party, and when we talk, I mean, he 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 agreed with a lot of things that libertarians said, and he even said that he now considers a socialist that could be pro free market if that could really mean socialism. But but it's kind of a parody of itself, alone because. I mean, liberals, the, the problem of, of liberals is that it's very complicated to, to work with libertarians because Carges, for example, tried to work with the radical left because the radical left opposed liberalism and 
I guess that's FDR, Kennedy, big state government. I, I guess can merge with with uh, anti statism I, I don't know. I guess that's the answer. For it. But I don't know. I guess so long is too weird even for for liberals. <laughs> Um, yeah, okay, so there are two, recently there were two god-awful salon pieces. Um, the one that Camilla was referring to was really am so amateur in its writing quality, and I, didn't, I confess I didn't read the whole thing because I didn't have time, but it was basically, I went to Honduras and everyone with guns everywhere, and it was, that's what libertarianism looks like, it's just... <laughs> I mean, there was nothing, it was just, it was garbage. It was such, and it was poorly written garbage, which is even even worse. Um, I wish I was more familiar with both that article and had read it and had it in front of me and with Honduras. Um, I know that, like, Latin America, there's there's this whole, whole giant can of problems with um, the idea that, that, you know, you, you have to choose between... Uh, like banana republics or uh, Marxism, or you have like Pinochet, and everyone says that's a free market, and like they're just yeah, uh, Latin America is a whole thing. But as I was saying early, I, I guess the El Alto, Jesus Walker has write about El Alto in in reason, and it's a very interesting mixing of of radical leftism and laissez-faire economics with um, a, a strange of also radical individualism. I mean, it's very interesting. Although I think I go, go to well, it's it's in Bolivia, and I guess I'm gonna go there soon to write something about it. It's because the the thing about especially with guns. I mean, the gun rights. I mean, here in Latin America, there are communities. I mean peasants that have guns. I mean, what's the problem? Like, people defend itself. Uh, the Black Panthers in the United States. I mean, the liberals should think in the Black Panthers when they when they are trying to, to restrict gun rights. Yeah, I think um, I saw a, a Slate article um, that I haven't read yet that, that, that I think I saw the headline and it's clearly referring to the Black Panthers and gun control and stuff. And I think liberals are finally, thanks to people like Thaddeus Russell, getting a little bit of a realization of that whole history and the very, very blatant attempt to disarm black communities. Um, I mean, the brilliant thing, it's too, it's too perfect to destroy part, like, knee-jerk partisanship when Governor Reagan helped disarm the Black Panthers yeah. and they wanted uh, to, you, you, their gun rights and their open carry rights. Um, it's just... Everyone should be, be force-fed that story, that true story, so that they realize that all of their assumptions may very well be wrong. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a whole other thing. I would like to learn more about that. And gun laws are screwing people over today with mandatory minimums. Go mm -hmm. Talk to Mike Riggs, my old colleague, who's now at Families Against Mandatory Minimums, about that. Um, if you have a gun on you during a drug sale, be legal. It could be strapped at your ankle and you never touch it. They can slap on another decade. Um, and they liberals need consider it violent crimes too. If you what? even have a, a gun on you, which you know, a lot of people are talking about the the problem with you know releasing people from jail that are non-violent offenders. But you know, in cases like that, where like you said, they don't even touch the gun, but it's present during a drug deal. There's this like, assumption that that they must have been an, a violent offender. And right, and they get classified as violent criminals, and then you know that's why. 50% of the prison population is, you know, violent offenders, even when a lot of times they're not. But that's a whole other topic again. Oh, so much hate, yeah. Um, as much as I want to go down that tangent road, I'll try to be good, um, because I actually have to do Bourbon and Bitches um, a little later tonight, double podcasting it up. <laughs> um, the other article was originally from Alternet, and it was published on Salon um, this week. Uh, excuse me, Burp. Um <laughs> And the whole point is it's it's full of some very basic, very tired cliches and cr uh, cliche critiques about libertarians. And it basically says, 
you guys are juvenile because you reject authority. And I find that a really disturbing argument. Um, it's lazy as hell, for one, but I think Michael, I don't know if it's Michael Badnerick, um, who at some point pointed out that, say you have lovely, nice, loving parents, you're still supposed to you know, choose your own career at some point, um, start your own family at some point, make a lot of decisions for yourself at some point, and how much better do parents know you than a local government, much less a state government, much less a federal government that could be, literally could be 3,000 miles away from you. Um, and you're still not supposed to do whatever your parents say for your whole life. So, I mean, I, I thought that was a good summation of, of, this, of this concept, but I find it really troubling that when I get the slur, oh, you're stuck, grow up, like you're so immature. Um, I mean, you just you, you want to start Godwin's lawing it up and saying like re, re, that's the sign of maturity is accepting whatever authority is is put upon you. I mean, that's horrifying. Then why? I mean, why would it be? Why would the left of all you know, alternates usually pretty strongly leftist? Why are they saying you know we shouldn't have, we should do what we're told, we should do what government is told? I mean, isn't that you know that's not something you really think you'd see from, you know, these are supposed to be like left, left, not like Hillary Clinton left, but like Bernie okay, Sanders yeah. left, and they're saying, oh yeah, you know, you should just obey what government says, no matter what. Well, as I learned in college, there is a very insidious type of leftist who may even think that they're not as corporate, you know, as Hillary Clinton. Um, there's this idea like uh, democracy means we're the government, and that takes all of the malevolence and the threat out of government. And they believe that government is somehow accountable. Corporations are never accountable, but government can be changed because we're the government. It's this really stupid type of optimism. Um, and there's also the, the, idea, the concept of the social contract. Um, I, the, the the salon or the alternate piece is not specific enough. It's it's sort of really just tired Ayn Rand and Rand Paul, the only libertarians I've ever heard of, neither of which are pure libertarian. They're sort of offshoots. Um, and, you know, the, I don't know. But that's, that's interesting because I guess that usually the libertarian war has been portrayed as being part of the right and especially with Ayn Rand, but they right. don't talk about Samuel Edward Bonkin, for example, or Robert Anton Wilson, that were some kind more on the left. Well, they're not educated enough to know people. I mean, they don't even know, um, I'm trying to think, you know, I, I don't know, you could talk about Reason, Cato, C4SS, um, Rothbard, uh, he's all lo he's loaded, um, obviously. I mean, a lot of them have their have their flaws. Hayek, Mises, like I don't know, just pick somebody. Um, and there are more leftists than I'm naming right now because I'm trying to off the top of my head. But I'm not, you know, writing an article that I extensively researched. Like, they don't name anybody. They named the, he named. We should be grateful. I don't, I I don't think he names Paul Ryan as a libertarian. Oh, okay. You know. But he he does talk about Scott Walker. He's, oh, does he? Oh. Obviously, he mentions Gordon Gecko. Um, yeah. God, what a cliche! I mean, it's just so char. It's just cliche after cliche, and it's basically yeah. like they just go back and like repackage old articles that they've already written and just rearrange it <laughs> and slap a you know a header image of Anne Rand and Rand Paul together. <laughs> just call it a day. It's like, oh, we got another one. Our weekly, you know, hit piece on libertarianism. You know, but the, that's the thing that it, to me, what was most horrifying, I guess, about the piece was not, not the, like, the usual cliche stuff, but just how ignorant of the libertarian tradition it was, especially, there's two claims, the most egregious was the whole, like, oh, really, libertarians love big corporations and support cronyism. That was just complete BS. But the other thing is, they he he put in that basically, because libertarians are individualists for the most part, 
that they're anti-society. Yeah. And that that's, to me, really insane, because the libertarian tradition, so much of it is literally trying to preserve society. I mean, like, and, and it, it's, it's, it's because we think that government damages society and undermines it that we are opposed to government. We're not opposed to government because we hate society and want everyone to be, like, hermits living by themselves. You know, it's, yeah, so out there that it's just laughable, you know? I mean, it seems like, okay, you might disagree, but the, the, the idea that civil society and, and government are separate by their nature, uh, shouldn't they be able to figure that concept out, even if they have, you know, something to dispute? Yeah. Like, at least make the disagreeing on a little higher level than... You will. You can't live in a cabin because because we're all interdependent. And where are you yeah. gonna get your shoes or whatever? I mean, like, okay, fine. Tell me why it wouldn't work, but don't tell me just things that are not related to mm -hmm. to, to, to what libertarians actually believe. You but the you can go and try to be a hermit in the woods and like be your own personal old, like juice philosophy of self-reliance and it probably won't work but you can certainly go try um, I mean there, there, are, there are religious libertarians um, lots of them you know they like their churches and they they have very staunch beliefs and they do not want to force you to follow those beliefs I have great respect for religious libertarians um, David Bowes who I'm, I was pleasantly surprised by his, his recent book. It's like an update of an older book. Um, he talks a ton about, like, he's such a, he, he really counters all of the bullshit against libertarians very well. Um, and he even sneaks into, like, well, someday we could privatize everything, maybe. <laughs> but we're not there yet. Um, but he, he doesn't rule it out, which I really appreciated. Um, but he's all about civil society and all about, I mean, the beautiful summation of, you know, things being... Human of human action, not human design. Like, mm -hmm. do you think that that idiot has ever heard of that concept that so yeah. lovely, lovely sums up how it, so many other interactions and yes, mm -hmm. groups function? It's just such a. Ugh. In a way, it's his. It's his view that's the really childish one because it's the libertarians who are like, society is so complex and one we can't centrally plan it, but. His view is that the government, if through force, is capable of planning out something as complex as society and the market and everything. So that's really the kind of like very childish view of just like calling to an authority figure to fix something, you know, and just whining about it. You know? Exactly. Um, and I mean, liberalism is this. It's a great contradiction. It's it's pessimistic utopianism, because mm -hmm. Uh, you and I, we couldn't run our own lives. That's ridiculous. But this dude 2,000 miles away could totally do it, and he can do it better than you can. It doesn't work. I mean, there, 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 there's, there's a flaw in, 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 in their ideas because if we're that terrible and we're, you know, we're, we're, that, we're that nasty British and short, huh? um, <laughs> then, like, how could we possibly figure out how to run an entire country, particularly one as big as the United States. I don't, I don't get it. Um, sometimes liberals do admit their pessimism, but a lot of the time they're not even aware that, that, that that's kind of, that is what they believe. But if liberalism means empire, then maybe as Daniel McCarthy of the American Conservative says, then there is a bigger question, and, and well, he's a, an anarchist also, an anarcho-conservative by, by difference of, of many on the libertarian movement, but... Is he really an anarchist? Uh, huh? Is he an anarchist? I didn't know that. He calls himself a Tory anarchist. Yeah, that's right, that's right, he is. Okay, that's cool. He, and and <laughs> I, I guess that, that finally, I mean, even one guy on the Heritage Foundation, it's... Um, one said that, that the the cultural war was never going to win. The only win that they could do is 
abolish the state and maybe there will be some conservative communities. Which, um, maybe, yeah. And that's one reason I can, can't go, like, I wish I had a left, like, I wish I had a, like, an American left libertarian, like my, many of my SFL, other SFL friends here to berate about left libertarianism. Because oh. they're such, they're, they're good friends, like I love them dearly now, but they're I'm not. terrible people. No, they're not. <laughs> you know, terrible philosophies. Well, I mean, I like I like them because you know, twenty uh, twelve hundred comment Facebook threads about punk rock, like with <laughs> other libertarians. That's literally my adolescent dream come to life, more or less. Um, but yeah, this idea, like, I don't have to find all ways of living morally equal, but I also don't feel quite comfortable advocating some of my social views hither and thither and correcting people about various terms. There's just something about it. I don't feel comfortable with that. I mean, I'm busy smashing the state, I guess that's the idea. <laughs> we we got to do a whole um, uh, lefty type or anti-lefty type debate on here one of these days. <sighs> so <laughs> proceed, please. Oh, oh, well, I was going to say, just like, in defense of the left libertarians, I'm not a left libertarian, but they're, I have a ton of friends who are like, mutual friends, but right. the, what I love about the left libertarians is they're just so radical and passionate, you know, so it's like, uh, I find that very refreshing, even if sometimes I'm, you know, find them a little tiresome, you know, <laughs> from time to time, but I, I, I admire their grind. Tiresome, like when they sabotage my one speech by making the guy introduce me as a left libertarian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That was great. Never forgiven for that. <laughs> the internet says that forever that I'm a left libertarian now. It's all his fault. <laughs> Never forgive him. Um. So, but anyway, though, like I just, I know it's easy to say when faced with a terrible critique of my ideology, but a a good critique is like just at least have a good critique, you yeah. know. And I've seen, I've seen better ones than this. This is this is pretty. This is near the bottom of the barrel in terms of sophistication. Well, um, the, the author is writing a biography on John Mellencamp, so. <laughs> I saw that. I really wanted to read. Uh, the American Troubadour. I mean, come on. No one likes John Mellencamp. <laughs> Please, John Cougar. The Coog. You know how you know how it is. Oh God, that's terrible. Um, I'm distracted by that now. Um, no, I can do this. I actually think that debating with not left libertarians, but farther what they sometimes call social anarchists, like Joe and I's cousin, whom I love very dearly, and some of his friends. He has a very smart friend who is practically an anarcho-primitivist socialist, like all awful, but he's very smart. And he can talk to you, and you know he he you flex your muscles to like, you know what is property like what we're gonna get down to the nitty gritty and mm -hmm. stuff, um, and that could be really good for you. Um, it's you know it's, it's, actually I, I think there there is something interesting in in, in Chile there is a um, a group that is the front of of libertarian students, but it's not. Uh, libertarians in the American sense, mm -hmm. it's libertarians in the communist libertarian sense, but they are trying to to create a political party, and and they have won the 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 student leadership in the University of Chile and in several universities. They are the largest student group in in Chile, and they could be elected in the next election. So I think it's very interesting. I, I don't know how the anarchist community internationally is going to react, but I think it's going to be interesting. Well, in my experience, the social anarchists, I don't know what the good terminology is exactly, but frequently it's the type of people who, you know, black hoodies protesting those globalization summits type people. And they're also the people who ostensibly are totally against the state yet mysteriously find themselves allying with Democrats, but would never, would barely speak to a libertarian. And that's an only slightly unfair summation. Like, I, that's why I don't, I, they don't trust our anti-state, um, like, bona fides, and I don't trust theirs either. So there's a bit of a divide there. 
I, I, I guess that Murray Bookchin once wrote that, that libertarians, um, anarcho-communists and anarcho-syndicalists should be allies against the totalitarian Stalinists and the totalitarian liberals. Yeah, I guess that, that's, that's kind I, of true. I think it's kind of true. I mean, you know, even like Wendy McElroy, who's not, who's anarchist, but not sort of the left libertarians, um, you know, she's written like, I, if, if y'all want to have a commune down the street, a, a commie commune, I'm not going to come down and be like, no, the free market, get yeah. out of there and start trading. Like, so that's, and, and when you get down to that, and then, you know, there's David Bowes, it just like book where he's t all the stuff about just extreme decentralization, and you got my cousin, and suddenly it's almost like everyone's on the same page. But they really don't realize it. There's, there's, there, there is. I mean, it might be like an actual cultural divide. It's just maybe a lack of trust. Um, the way that I understand why some people don't trust Christian libertarians and and and, and caps that when they say, "I swear to you, I do not want to force my views on you," and by the same token, you know, people who are overly opposed to live libertarians, um, they have this feeling that they're going to force all of their social liberalism on everybody else. Like, there's, like, a lack of trust, and, I mean, I guess it's based on history and human nature to some extent, but we could be on the same page, just not on the page of the alternate guy, because <laughs> his yeah. page is no. poorly constructed. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I'm glad that we destroyed him, whatever his name is. Yeah. Yeah. The next task. Actually, I think this is a good. Um, we're, we're not, you know, we'll, we'll we'll make this a bit of a shorter one because I um I need to prune my impulses to talk for two hours. But so let's do a thing where we end by talking about something not political that we've been enjoying in the past week or month because it's been a while since I podcasted. Joe, share with the class, would you? Uh, well. Using your Christmas present to me, the Amazon gift card, I've been enjoying, uh, I read a Chuck Klosterman book. Oh, no. Which was Joe, okay. Joe's finally a hipster. He's finally found Chuck Klosterman. No, no. I mean, it was, it was almost too hipstery for me. But then, for all of you. then I read um, High Fidelity. Yes. And it, it kind of the same made, made me want to kill all hipsters because... Rob, the the main character, is such a tool when it comes to music, and he's the opposite of me basically in everything. But it was a good book. Isn't it a good uh, book though? It is. Oh, it's great. And then yeah. I bought a uh, Lester Bangs um, book too, so I went all in on the music, literary, literary kind of stuff. So that's Thank um. You for that. I'm excited Thank by you. the fact that you're reading High Fidelity, and Nick Hornby is is good. There's a book, he did another novel, his other like, music-heavy one called Juliet Naked, which is also pretty good. It's not quite as good as High Fidelity. Um, I love Nick Hornby, though. He's good. Mm -hmm. um, not oh much God. happiness, though. Yeah, well, that, that, that will happen in life. I haven't read any Lester Bangs. My association with Lester Bangs is pretty much Philip Seymour Hoffman being amazing. In all right. Yes. R.I.P. Forever. But I guess Harrison Ford's gonna be okay, um, because uh, by the time this like the by the time this is on YouTube, like we'll have forgotten about this life crisis. But Harrison Ford is an American treasure, and he needs to stay with us, no matter how grumpy he gets, and no matter how bad the new Star Wars are, and no matter how stupid his earring is, he is he's just childhood and who is that hot hunk of man in the early '80s. So. I just need a moment to express my love of Harrison Ford. That's really, I mean, that's apparently what I'm doing right now. Um, I read an okay YA zombie novel last night, and I feel well balanced because I've been I was listening to like rickety old uh, folk and blues, but also Taylor Swift's Red album, which is clearly her best album, which unfortunately is what all the hipsters say too. So there's no hope for me. <laughs> Um, well, I don't know. Michelle, what about you? The last uh, I'm going to 
I'm yeah. gonna break your rule. Uh, I haven't been enjoying anything because I've been sick, so I haven't yeah. been able to like drink coffee. <laughs> and uh, winter sucks, uh, especially for a, a Floridian like me. Um, but I have been. I really enjoy. I'm, I don't think this got enough coverage, but uh, and I'm totally gonna mention a political thing here, sort of. Um, Spencer you always Ackerman's break my rule. I like it on the Chicago PD black site. Yes, um, which was nuts. And if people out there listening haven't checked it out yet, they should. And uh, so I, I, a lot of good stuff coming out from the Guardian recently. Um, that's what I've been enjoying. Um, yeah. Yeah, enjoying. Um... Americans uh, being tortured on yeah. oil. It's, yeah, it's I read those. I suggest everyone read those. Um, but I don't know. Enjoying is the wrong word. Like when something horrible happens on Facebook and people click like, and I'm like, I understand what that's starting to mean, but I also don't want to click like when you tell me your dog ran over, was run over. God. Um, uh, Camillo, is there anything sort of non-political you've been reading or watching in the last while? Well, uh, reading the ugliest view of the biography that is kind of political, but um, I have been reading the well, uh, listening to or watching a band of alternative rock, I guess. Sounds good. Um, well, I am being very happy about the X Files revival uh, that I think now seems more serious, I, and I hope that that it could take some anarchists, more anarchists even than, than before, I guess, that now that Scully is a, has, has been out as a punk, it would be very <laughs> interesting. Um, yeah, my, my friend um, Seth, who has been on here, put photos of Jillian Anderson on my wall where she her secret punk passed in the 80s, and they're beautiful. Um, I'm always scared, just like I'm scared of the new Star Wars because we've all been hurt before. I'm scared of the idea of like an X Files reboot, but I have so many ideas that I want them to use exactly. Um, I really want I want it to happen. I do. I want it to be very 9/11 truthery, and I want there to be like an Alex Jones-esque figure who's either full of shit or totally true. Um, I think the X-Files is sort of minarchist because it makes you think, if I just join the government, I can help bring it down, which is sort of a dangerous sentiment. So more anarchist, I agree. Um, yeah, I want, I want this to happen even though I fear it could all lead to disaster. And other um, Star Wars and X-Files parallels being... Chris Carter and George Lucas are the same. They gave us an awesome fictional thing, and then they kind of ran it into the ground, whereas when other people were given control of it, it was amazing. So Chris Carter doesn't get to do anything except, like, write one episode, um, and they should get... They should just get Vince Gilligan to write the X-Files, because I care more about that than I care about Saul or Walter White. Sorry. Sorry, guys. Sorry, America. I went there. Um... Uh, I'm getting stuck in my tangents. Zach, what about you? Okay. Yeah, that's a little tough. Like, I don't do much other than read and fret about political things. But Yeah, no, I, I feel you. I, but... I did recently watch a very good movie called um, Where We Started by uh, Christopher Hansen. And it's, uh, it's sort of like an indie film, but it was like, Got a lot of accolades and everything. It's 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 it reminded me of um, I don't know if you've ever seen um, the only lovers left alive with uh, Tilda Swinton. Mm, no. Oh yeah, it's sort of. She's a fine little, little, white witch though. Yes, yeah, she's a vampire in that one. But it's sort of one of those movies where not much happens, and for some reason I really love those movies where it's just like all about like just a few characters sort of talking and working through things and then nothing really happens. It was sometimes, a good movie, though. Sometimes I like nothing happens. Like I, I like his podcast. I stopped that, Joe. <laughs> well, if we all had coffee, we just make, let's make it like a Jim Jarmusch uh, podcast. Or, you know, we need better cinematography to be like Lost in Translation or something <laughs> classy and like Jesus and Mary Chain are there and stuff. Um, 
There are a lot of good things in the world. I'm getting hungry, so I'm getting more tangential. But I feel like we had a pretty good podcast, kind of relaxed, but like friendly. I think we've done we've done it, folks. Um, do y'all need want to want to? Um, oh my god, I can't think of the word. Oh yeah, thank you. The other thing was pitch, and then like I was thinking about Billy Mays, and that's not right. Um, promote anything. I am kind of re redoing my schedule of writings myself. I did my final bad cop blotter for Vice which is kind of a bummer, but hopefully I'll do better things and I might write some other stuff for them because in spite of Vice's reputation, all of the editors I've ever worked with there are really nice. I actually made fun of one of them. I was like, dude, you're supposed to be like an edgy douchebag hipster. This is Vice. And he apologized. <laughs> um, but I still have Man of War stuff and the stag blog. Um, you know, I'm trying, I'm going to try to stag blog again some more and just, you know, in just, just rewatch all of Jericho and think about the apocalypse some more. So, you know, there's some, there's some stuff to read on there. So just go look at that, I guess. Um, I don't know. Joe, promoting anything? Um, my band's doing stuff. Act of Pardon. We were on DVE. We're going to have some shows. We're going to put a new album. Go to actofpardon.com. I don't do anything else. All right. That's all. Well, that's, that's it. You usually don't have anything to promote, so that's, a, that's definitely progress. I rarely um, do. <laughs> uh, Michelle, what about you? Anything? Promote Same anything in the world? Always check out Fee Foundation for Economic Education because I like that Coke money, not the drug. I'm kidding. I'm talking about the people who want criminal justice reform and are evil. Um, That's the one. Yeah, Fee. If you haven't checked it out, um, the Freeman online does are cool people over there, and I like them. All right, uh, Camillo. Anything the people should go look at? I am kind of writing something for Thunder Punch, and maybe there is going to be next week, I guess. All right. Sounds good. Uh, and Zach, where are you? Um, well, I, I wrote a piece for um, Young Voices Advocates about, about the terrible alternate salon piece. Ooh. That I'm not sure where they're going to publish it, if they end up publishing it. But if it's published, you should definitely check it out. And, um, um, well, you know, if um, if you want to send that to me when it's up, I can link it when I put this podcast up later. Okie dokie. All right. Sounds good. Um, and everyone should go look at Liberty.me, even unless you're looking at Liberty.me right now. In, in that case, well done. <laughs> um, all right. We had two good, solid first-time guests. Um, I restricted some tangents, but they could have been good. It's all good. Okay. Thank you to uh, Camillo and to Zach, our first-timers. Thank you to Joe and Michelle, our old-timers. Um, thank you, audience, for watching Politics for People Who Hate Politics. And tune in next time, hopefully next week. I'll try to be good. <laughs>